him for attending this Product Buds prototyping workshop event today. We're thrilled to have every single one of you. And uh, fun fact, this is actually uh, pretty much the one month anniversary of when Product Buds was launched. So in within a month of launching Product Buds, we have over a thousand community members globally with almost 600 people who've attended live Product Buds events such as this one. And we've had some amazing speakers in the past and today who have taught you all so much about product management, about how you can boost your skills and knowledge to be a great future product manager. So kudos to every single one of you that is in this call right now. You are all gonna be the next generation of product managers and that is so exciting. Um, so my name is Grace and I'm one of the co-founders of Product Buds. I'm currently a product manager intern at Salesforce and a rising senior at Northeastern University. I'm really excited to be uh, presenting to you all this amazing workshop, but before that, I'll let the rest of my team members make their introductions as well. Hi everyone, um, I'm Henrika, and I am an incoming product manager at Poly, actually starting my first full-time job tomorrow. And uh, previously, I was an associate product manager intern at Workday, and um, I am a recent grad from the University of Victoria. Joseph? Hey everyone, my name is Joseph. I'm a current senior at Emory's Gwazeta Business School studying marketing information system. I'm currently a PM intern at a small tech startup, and we're, I'm really excited for this uh, workshop and to have all of you guys here. Darsh? Hey everyone, uh, my name is Darsh and I recently graduated from Georgia Tech, Masters in HCI and I'm an incoming APM at UPS and I'm very glad to have you all here and would love to hear from where you all are. You can feel free to type in the Zoom chat box. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I'll I'll move into giving a brief overview of product buds and project jams for um, the new people who are joining us. So since we launched our community um, about a month ago, like what Grace said, we are now at over a thousand members from all over the world with unique backgrounds, skills, and passions. And the thing that really unites us all is our desire to eventually enter a product management role. And our team hopes that Product Buds will provide that space for you, for all of you to build lasting connections with others who have the same career goals and really take the proactive steps needed to become a part of the next generation of product leaders. And with Project Jam, our goal is to give you an opportunity to be immersed in the various stages of the product development process. You'll gain experience in conceptualizing a product, designing and building a prototype and testing it out on the market. And by the end of the project cycle, you can showcase that you acquired a PM mindset and skill set through the product pitch deck that you will be developing along with um, your product's prototype. So we're super looking forward to seeing all of your ideas come into fruition. And I'll pass it now to Darsh for the agenda for today. Thanks, Enrique. So for today, uh, first of all, as I said, happy to have all of you here. As far as how the rest of the, this call will flow, first, we will hear from three product leaders who will share their advice on developing great products, Adit, Tami, and Tushar. Then we will open the floor to any questions you may have for our guest speakers. To submit a question, you can use the link that is uh, being shared on the screen on slido.com and type in the code buds. And please mention if it is for a particular speaker or for the whole panel when you ask a question. Uh, we'll go to the questions in the last 15 minutes for a Q&A session. Lastly, we will close with the next steps and important reminders for the product birds, uh, lead, from the Product Buds leadership team. And uh, now, fortunately, as we have three amazing speakers with us, uh, before we start, uh, Adil, Tami, and Tushar, uh, can you please uh, introduce yourselves very quickly? Yeah, sure, I'll go. Uh, nice to meet you, everyone. My name is Adil, uh, and I was most recently a product manager at a company called Roadmonk in Toronto. 
Hey, I can go next. I'm Tashar. I'm a UXC intern at Google, and I'm doing my master's at Georgia Tech, actually from the same program as Darsh. And yeah, that's me. Hi, everyone. My name is Tammy. Um, in the past, been a product manager at Microsoft and intern at Redfin, and will be joining Redfin full time in a few weeks. Nice to meet you. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. So first, we have Adil. And Adil, you can take the stage. Awesome. Perfect. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Just give me one second. Cool. Let me know when you guys can see that. We're good. Awesome. Looks good. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Um, my name is Adil. I'm going to walk you through uh, two of my favorite topics in product management, uh, wireframes, and more thoroughly, um, crazy eights, which is a technique I love to use when I'm trying to generate ideas uh, for a design problem that I'm facing. Um, so before I dive into my presentation, I'd love to hear from a couple of you in the audience what you think a wireframe means to you. And just like any good PM, if I don't hear anybody in 10 seconds, I'm going to start picking on people. So I'd love to hear from somebody in the room what they think a wireframe is. It's a low-level diagram about uh, what we're actually planning to build. Awesome. Anyone else? Grace, Darsh. Making a, making a blueprint. Ah, perfect. Like it. One more. I feel it's to communicate an idea to a user or a stakeholder that how this product might look very low level and very kind awesome. of just over the top. Fantastic. Love it. And those are all great ideas and they're 100% right. And this is how I like to think about wireframes. So for me, a wireframe is really a simplified representation of a website or app. Um, they can be hand drawn or they're digital, but oftentimes they're simply just like lines and text. And I used to wonder when I first got into product management, why the hell did it look so crappy? Like who could ever like um, figure out what this even means? Like why would somebody design it this way? But then I realized the whole purpose of wireframes is really just to organize the structure of information and elements on a page. It's not about colors, it's not about font, it's not about pixel perfection. And that's why you'll often see wireframes crappily drawn like the one I have on my right, uh, because the whole purpose here is to, not, is to not distract the audience with minute details like, hey, like, is this the right color to be using? Does this match our brand? Is this actually our copy? It's more so about just how information is laid out. So you can have a thorough discussion about what makes sense and where it makes sense on that page. In terms of what the key benefits of wireframes are, I think they're really three. Uh, one, they're super quick to make. All you need is a pen and paper generally. I know in the age of COVID, we're all digital. So you can use digital tools as well, not a problem. But the really nice thing is you can get engineers in the room, QA, someone who's not even got a design background. And if you give them a pen and paper and they're, they're good to go, they're fully equipped to be able to participate in a wireframing session. Uh, secondly, they're super fast to iterate on. Uh, feedback is like almost provided instantly. And if changes need to be made, oftentimes uh, when you're working uh, in a boardroom, for example, on a whiteboard, you can just get up, erase what was there before and try something new right away. And lastly, the third reason, or the third benefit I think they really provide is that they're super cheap to make. Unlike uh, high fidelity mockups, which you know are often made in, in Figma or Sketch and often takes maybe hours or days of a designer's time to produce, uh, wireframes are super cheap. You can get something mocked up in a couple of minutes rather than a couple of hours, uh, and it doesn't cost a whole lot. And as product managers and as aspiring product managers in the room, once you get into the product world, you have to start thinking about, hey, how much of my team's time uh, are they spending on a particular project? Because product designers are very heavily paid and you want to make sure that they're utilizing their time um, efficiently. So these are the three benefits that wireframes, I think, really provide. And now that we have some understanding of wireframes, I'd love to dive into um, the crazy eight technique. So this is a technique that, was, that I was first introduced to um, at Roadmonk um, by a senior product designer. Um, and really all it is, is a super fast sketching exercise that challenges you to sketch eight distinct ideas in eight minutes. And oftentimes um, this idea is, or this um, technique is great to use when you're first starting out, you've got a problem in front of you, but maybe the juices aren't quite flowing in your head and you're struggling a little bit coming up with how you want to lay out that particular uh, problem on a page, uh, whether that's a mobile app or, or a website, for example. Now, in terms of the crazy eight overview, I think there's only really like one prerequisite that you really need. And 
all that is is, hey, what problem or challenge are you trying to solve? That's really the only prerequisite you need to kind of use this technique. Apart from that, anything really goes. Um, the goal of the crazy eight technique here is to generate a solution to your challenge. Whether that's, hey, how do I build this login page or how do I build this sign up page on mobile? What does the onboarding flow look like? I know there's a lot of cool projects um, that a lot of you have submitted during, during Project Jam. Um, this technique can be used for a whole variety of products or projects and there's really no limitation. Uh, at the end of the exercise, really the deliverable is gonna be eight distinct ideas that you can discuss with your team pick and choose elements from and take that to the next step and maybe build a more high fidelity wireframe um, that you can use to kind of shop around and get buying on. Cool, with that being said, now that we understand what wireframes are, we kind of understand um, at a high level what the crazy eight technique is all about. Let's go ahead and dive in in terms of how you actually go ahead and execute this technique. So step one, um, come up with some rough elements that you want on the page. So spend a few minutes to think through what elements and information make sense on the page for the problem you're trying to solve. So for example, if I was designing, say, the Uber Eats homepage on mobile, what are some of the things that would make sense to be on that page? Well, it probably makes sense for a user to be able to see some sort of special offers. It probably makes sense for the user to be able to search for a restaurant. They probably want some sort of order tab so they can see which orders they've placed. And they probably want to be able to view a list of restaurants at the very least, if not food categories on top of that. Um, with step one, writing this down really clears your head and puts you in a good headspace in terms of what it is exactly that you're going to be trying to wireframe once you start this technique. Cool. Step two, and this is where it gets really fun, is to grab a piece of paper and fold it into eight sections. And the whole idea here is you're going to be spending one minute per section trying out something new. Um, and I know we're all in the COVID world right now. You can do this digitally. I found a really awesome tool called Envision Freehand. Uh, which lets you create a grid digitally and collaborate. It's fully free. I highly recommend you checking it out. But really, all you really want to do here is get a piece of paper or a grid and make eight sections out of it. Cool. Once you've made those eight sections, set an eight-minute timer. This is the whole purpose of a crazy eight technique. You're going to be making uh, one sketch or wireframe per minute. Um, if you're in a group setting, which I think this technique works really well in, uh, have somebody be the designated time taker. Uh, and make sure that every as every one minute passes, uh, someone has some sort of vocal cue or a timer uh, to encourage everybody in the room to move on to the next section on their crazy eight uh, grid. And the whole purpose here is don't worry about if you haven't finished a section, it's not a big deal. The whole purpose of the crazy eight exercise is to push you out of your comfort zone beyond the first idea uh, and generate multiple ideas by the end of the eight minutes. Uh, so this is an example that I've made here. Um, going back to the Uber Eats example again, I spent one minute per box to try to come up with different ways I can maybe lay out the home screen. So you can see that, first of all, the wireframes are super messy. No one cares. Um, they all look like crap. I'm not a designer, especially as product managers, you're going to be expected to be leaders in the room. And when you're in a room full of engineers, oftentimes they might feel a little bit intimidated, whether that's by the product manager or the product designer in the room that, hey, I don't really know how to sketch that well. That's totally okay. That's not the point of this exercise. Use a fatter marker so you're not you know, being pixel perfect. It's not a problem. Secondly, push beyond the first box, right? Sometimes it can be really hard to kind of get your uh, thoughts flying, your creativity flying, but there's no such thing as a dumb idea at this point. Keep pushing because the the, one of the benefits to the crazy eight technique is yes, maybe that particular wireframe in that box might not look great, but maybe a part of it does. Maybe there's an element here and there that you can cherry pick and then combine to make a really solid uh, wireframe, a really solid mock-up um, that you can use. So here, for example, you can see I've got a couple different ideas going on in the first box. In the top left, I've got you know super simple search bar at the top with maybe some sort of image box at the bottom for maybe the restaurant. Uh, in the second uh, panel, top right, I've kind of changed the layout a little bit. I've got a tab layout at the bottom with the home button, the search button, maybe like some sort of receipts button. Um, and then in the bottom left, for example, I have kind of like a carousel view, which maybe users can use to kind of scroll through the restaurants with. Again, it's all about coming up with different ideas that you'll be able to share with the with your team at the end of the at the end of the exercise. Cool. So what's step five? At this point, the eight minutes are over. You've got uh, a couple different wireframes on your uh, grid. What do you do now? And this is where you present your ideas and vote. And this is a really important part, especially in a group setting. Pick your top two or three ideas on your grid 
and go around the room and present them. Give a brief overview, 30 seconds, a minute tops, uh, and let everybody know what you were thinking in terms of how you went about solving that problem that was discussed at the start of the exercise. And there's no reason to be afraid. Don't worry about what it looks like. It's really about, hey, what was I trying to portray with this particular wireframe? And the really cool thing is, as you go around the room, people will bring different perspectives based on their backgrounds, and you'll usually find some sort of really unique idea um, or unique uh, way to tackle that particular challenge. And what I really like to do, and this is an optional step, but I really like to give everybody three votes or depending on the number of people in the room, four or five votes. And I ask everybody at the end to go ahead and vote on their most favorite, um, say wireframe, depending on, um, depending on the different grids that people have come up with. And at the end of it, oftentimes you end up in a situation where a particular idea stands out or a particular element stands out. Maybe a lot of people don't like the idea of a search bar at the very top, but they really think that carousel idea is pretty cool. Right? So at the end of the exercise, you're able to kind of pick apart different elements that everybody's kind of drawn and put that together to come up with a unique idea to the particular challenge you were trying to solve. So in brief, that's the crazy it exercise um, as a whole, just to quickly summarize what that really looks like. Uh, step one, write down the elements and information you want on the page. Uh, step two, grab a piece of paper or use something like Envision Freehand to digitally uh, split the page into eight sections. Step three, set an eight minute timer and spend about one minute per section and draw something new in each section, whether that's a new element or a new idea. Don't worry about your idea looking stupid. It can be super crazy. And this is your idea is flying. And then step four, kind of start wireframing. Um, and then step five, present your ideas to the room and have everybody vote on what they think is the best idea. Have a discussion. You've got eight awesome ideas in front of you. Some of them are gonna be super crazy. Some of them are gonna be super lame. That's totally okay. Uh, it's a collective effort. So that's a brief summary of what the Crazy A technique looks like. It's something that I love running uh, with my engineering and, and product teams um, when I'm working. It's something that you can usually um, devote half an hour to and get some really great ideas uh, flowing out of the room. Uh, and it's a super easy technique to run in real life. All you really need is a pen and paper. Um, so in summary, one last page I'd love to leave you with is I know a lot of people might be wondering what resources they use here really to uh, Envision Freehand, like I mentioned before, is a really awesome free tool that you can use to collaborate. It's basically like an infinity canvas. You can go ahead and make um, different sketches on with your mouse, super awesome. And if you want to learn more about the Crazy Yet technique, and it was really popularized by Google through the Design Sprint methodology, uh, check, it out, check it out at designsprintkit.withgoogle.com. Uh, they've got a pretty cool write-up about how you can run this uh, in different scenarios. Um, so that's the Crazy Yet technique and a bit about wireframes. If you've got any questions, please fill them out in Slido and I would love to answer them at the end. Um, hopefully this has given you some insight in terms of how you can generate some ideas. Uh, I know there's a lot of us um, in the room today who are taking part in the project jam. So really looking forward to what you guys come up with. Thanks guys. Thank you, Adil. Uh, those were pretty interesting insights. I especially love the idea where you kind of have to diverge a lot and just keep yeah. wireframing, keep getting exactly. ideas. The more you have, the better. Exactly. So next up, we have Tushar. So Tushar, feel free to take it away. Um, Adil, if you could stop sharing. Oh, yes. Sorry. There you go. Thank you. One sec. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Looking good. Awesome. I'm just trying to pull up the chat. Oh, okay. So, uh, Great, great job, I loved hearing all of those insights and I can vouch for the fact that uh, during the first phase of my internship at Google, uh, I have been using the crazy it's method a lot personally to, you know, get those initial ideas out on paper, but okay. And this is like a perfect segue because now we're going to talk about how you take Adil's ideas from, from the low fidelity stage to a higher fidelity where you can present it to your stakeholders. Uh, but before we do that, just like a quick intro, I'm a second year master's student at Georgia Tech. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a UXE internship at Google right now. In the past, I did my undergrad in CS. Uh, that's why I'm at this weird intersection of design and code right now. And apart from all of that, I'm passionate about inclusive design, entrepreneurship, and also during this quarantine, cooking. Uh, so that's that. And now, uh, just like a quick insight into the design process. Uh, so the, I would say this is like a very generic one. I'm sure there's like many versions of it, but as far as PMs go, I feel like, uh, you know, they, they really drive the vision at the start of every project. So they write the PRDs, they come up with the initial ideas, and these ideas are then transformed into like, uh, you know, wireframes by the design teams. 
And a lot of you might have not heard about the term UXC. Um, I, I sort of got to know about it last year, but uh, we're sort of in the middle of design and engineering. So we're, we're good with design and code, and we sort of act as the middleman between you know, what the designers make and how we transform that into uh, engineering prototypes. And then, you know, obviously we, we hand it over to the engineers and they end up shipping the actual features through a feedback loop. Uh, but here's a, a section for audience interaction. Uh, I hope someone answers, but why do you guys think we need to prototype things in the first place? Why can't designers just make their things and send it to engineers to just make it? So we know what's going to come about the product uh, before you even invest a lot of time and effort before we get into the engineering team. So any kind of corrections with the stakeholders or clients or with the product manager can be dis discussed and taken, uh, corrected during this phase of prototyping. We can get a minimum, minimum viable product uh, at the start just to check the feasibility and the demand to start with. Yeah, and those are all, yeah, yeah. Even in the, all, all of the people in the chat, basic ideas for start on, yep. And just to, you know, put that into perspective. So yeah, uh, obviously you, you want those proof of concepts and then, but you also want to reduce the dependency on Swiss because Swiss are not going to build every idea that a designer has. So you have to test these ideas and Tami is going to talk a lot about user testing and how you test these prototypes. But, you know, just having those, having that middle phase where you can test all of these ideas, figure out which ones work and then hand them over to engineering. Uh, that's sort of the idea. And now let's dive into a quick example. So imagine if you were like a, a designer or a, or a prototyper and you had this amazing idea for a social networking app that sort of connects aspiring PMs, never been done before, obviously. Uh, this app wants to like build a community to enabling discussion, attending all of these awesome, cool events, which are sometimes virtual, sadly. Uh, and you also want to provide mentorship through this platform. But you have like a week to present the idea to other members of the team and sell them on it. Uh, so in terms of uh, how you would go about doing this, let's, let's walk through this together. Uh, I would love some audience interaction here again. Uh, what do you think an app like this should do? Like, what do you think are the main parts of this? And I sort of like gave you a hint here, but uh, feel free to type some things that you think the app should have sections for maybe. Let's hear a few. User profiles, nice. Chat, events, discussion. Yep, mentorship, all right. Calendar. Yeah. Event calendar. Yeah, 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 awesome, okay. So I'm going to cheat a little bit because I know this is a live thing, but I feel like this sort of covers some of the things that you guys were talking about and we're using green because product buds is green. Uh, and okay, so we have this basic homepage ready. And since we're in, a, we're, we're in an event right now, let's talk about, let's, let's design an event space really quickly on Figma. And oh, I just realized that I should have shared this file if you guys want to Yep, I'm going to zoom in. Thanks. Uh, if you guys want to follow along on the Figma file, but okay, we're we're going to make an events prototype. Uh, I heard there's like a cool event going on at this workshop. So I'm just going to, oops, that's big. Uh, but okay, so we have, we're, I, I, I'm going to make a super basic UI. So, you know, just extend this, how to prototype great products. Oh, I can see cursors on my screen. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I was having fun. Just don't like delete my stuff, please. Uh, but okay. Maybe a date. That seems important. 1 to 2 p.m. Okay. So we have this basic event UI and maybe we can extend this, make it into a, you know, a bunch of events. And now, okay, I want to hear about, uh, let's say if you want to make an events detail page, what would that look like? What do you think, uh, what are the user actions that we would want to perform on the uh, user events page? Connect to the meeting directly. So like a, a meeting button that directly takes you to the, mm -hmm. uh, the meeting time. Yeah. Uh, the meeting room. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I didn't expect this much audience interaction. I, I might have to zoom that in or something. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so register. Uh, register, I would say, is one of the major things. 
So let's say we have something like that in here. And I'm, I'm quickly gonna copy paste a bunch of text that describes the event. Uh, okay, and now let's have two buttons. Uh, I'm gonna go off the Facebook way to do it. And that is to basically have like a button here that says either you can like register directly for it. This is, yeah, okay. So you can register for it or you can pretty much show your interest in it maybe. And we know that the primary action is green because that's our primary color. This can probably be interest of the secondary color. We don't have that yet. Uh, okay. And then, so this is, uh, okay, now I'm also going to add a back button here so I can show you quickly how to do that. But okay, at this point, let's make our first prototype uh, interaction in Figma. So let's say we're on this thing. We go to the prototype tab here and we just drag this thing here and boom, we have a prototype. Let's, let's see how that looks. Look at that. Oh, no, this is showing the old one. Oops. Uh, but okay, you get the idea. So you basically, you know, drag that and if you click that, it's gonna open this. Uh, but okay, what else? Um, now if we, <laughs> wow, that was quick. I know, right? <laughs> uh, there's also a smart animate thing, which is if you sort of drag the same, hmm, oh, that's, that has to be on top. Live demos are interesting. Uh, <laughs> okay, and now it says registered. Oh, add this to your calendar. Okay, and then if we hopefully go here, and we drag this again. Now what we're gonna do is do, oh, that's right. Instead of instant, we're going to say smart animate. And Figma is like sort of super smart. And uh, the name of the tool is Figma. Uh, so what happens is if it recognizes that there's two layers that are the same across this and we're changing the properties inside those layers, it's just going to do those uh, animations for us automatically. So if I press this, it's just going to have a nice slide in animation there. And I really don't know why it's sharing the wrong artboard, but it's basically doing this, which I've already made. It's like similar. Uh, okay, other things that we can do is have like a share button here. Uh, so a share button, a share button, as you can probably tell, is probably going to have like a, a modal. So in that sense, let's copy paste a modal. Sorry, I'm cheating again. Uh, and that's just gonna, Jesus. Okay. Let's just copy paste that in here. And boom. Okay. Uh, oh, actually I just realized that we don't need this. Sorry. Quick. Uh, okay. Another thing that we can do is when you go back to the prototyping tab and we say that I want to click this and I wanted to open this thing. So on tap and you say open overlay and it's at the bottom. Yes. And you want to close it when you click outside it and you want an overlay behind it. And then when you go back to the prototype, oh, that work. okay. So that sort of like pops in from the bottom as an overlay. And when you click outside, it should, you know, disappear. Uh, can someone tell me how I'm doing on time and if I can talk about more things? <laughs> you you have a couple of minutes. You can go okay. for like three, four minutes. Okay, okay. So let's do another thing where we... So obviously in a, in a mobile app, you're not going to always... You're going to have scrolls in your mobile app. So let's see how we can add a scroll. So suppose you have multiple events to show. You just copy them around. Oh, let's make this bigger, nice long scroll. Uh, and yeah, 
but what you what you're going to do is sort of fix certain elements because you don't want your action bar and your bottom navigation bar to scroll as you're scrolling the content inside the page so how once you once you click those things up you click share and now you can see that you have a nice scrolly thing in your in your bird eye so i think the point is that you know these things are super quick and you can quickly just uh <laughs> you guys are too nice in the comments but you can quickly you know do these things in figma and this isn't the only app that you can use to do these things there's like adobe xd sketch i like figma because it's free so and you know it just works and everyone has it and in terms of being a pm figma is a great tool to know because a lot of companies are switching to figma and it has amazing collaboration features so there's all of you on the screen right now i want to see if i can give you edit permissions be nice maybe refresh the page but you should be able to add things to my artboards now if you guys want to try that but yeah uh just you know just go wild and uh scrolling is here i, I just want to make sure did i have anything else uh yeah i mean yeah there's a bunch of things that you can do and there's obviously complex things complex animations and overlays that you can try but for for you know a beginner from a pm level perspective i think just knowing how to make these interactions might help you during the project jam and yeah that's pretty much it from my side well that was pretty good i am seeing comments in the chat that oh, that sounds so easy now i've never used figma but i'm going to try tomorrow so thank you tushar for a really good demo and who knows maybe you can make product bird zap soon <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, so last but not the least, we have Tammy, who's a former product manager from Redfin and Microsoft, and she's going to talk about user testing and how do you uh, figure out from a PS a PM's perspective. So, Tammy, take it away. Uh, we are not able to hear you, Tammy. No, you, uh, your earphones may not be working. Yeah, maybe just remove the earphones. Hello. Yep, we can hear you now. Okay, cool. All right, so, um, so Adil talked a little bit about how you brainstorm ideas with the Crazy Eights technique. Tushar talked about how do you prototype those ideas a little bit. At a higher fidelity, I'm going to share with you about how you usability. How can you user test your prototype? Specifically, talking about usability testing. So, first of all, what is usability testing, and why do you do it? Um, usability testing is a research method for evaluating your products with real users. So, there are many ways you can user test, but usability testing specifically is all about using testing with people who you want to use your product. So you don't want to just use like a friend or a family member if they're not your real user. And the reason why you do it, Tushar talked, touched on this a little bit, is you want to get those insights early on. You want to be able to um, kind of find any issues early on, but also it helps you answer both objective and subjective questions, such as, you know, can a user add a song to a playlist or do they find the experience enjoyable? So before I move forward, um, I want to kind of open it up to everyone and ask, when you're usability testing, what are the things that you think you need to do before you user test? How do you prepare for your user test? If you feel to speak, I don't know how to, ah, chat, okay. Okay, gather a diverse sample of testers, yeah. Determine questions you want to answer. Awesome, identify target user base. Yeah, so those are all correct. Um, all great points. So yeah, before your user test, you want to identify your research goals. So that is common for any you know, research method you're using, but why are you doing this user test? What are you trying to achieve from it? What are you trying to learn? Then you want to have a script, right? So you want to have a guided script of what you want to ask the participants, your initial open-ended questions, the tasks that you want them to do, any follow-up 
a question. So someone in the chat mentioned, give the users a checklist for what they should try to achieve. So yeah, so that's basically tying to your script. And you want to pre-screen participants. So a lot of people mentioned about finding your target population. So pre-screening is part, part of the ways you can target that. So if you're creating an app, uh, you know, creating a group for people that are aspiring PMs that are maybe still in college, you want to screen that those are your actual participants and that they meet those criteria. And lastly, you want to pilot your test. So just going through, once you've created your script, you want to just pilot it with anyone that's not within the team to make sure that you've worked out all the kinks with your test. Okay, now during the test, um, generally you wanna have at least two members present. So one person facilitating, kind of asking questions and one person observing or note taking. You can have three, you can have one observer, one note taker, one facilitator, but generally you don't wanna have too many people so you don't overwhelm the participant, you know? It's scary when you have five interviewers and you know one person interviewing being interviewed it's the same thing with you know user testing um and then second you want to avoid leading questions so you don't want to ask like you know do you like this that already is telling the user that they should like it so avoid leading questions you want to ask the participant to think aloud so you can hear what they're thinking and you want to take note of what the user does and what they don't do Right, so that's why you need one person that is observing so they can really take note of, okay, they're able to find this, but also they didn't notice this other thing. And that's just as important. So I'm going to show a quick video. Um, it's seven minutes long, but I'm only going to show two minutes. It's, this video is just of a dad use, uh, user testing his prototype with his daughter. And it touches on a few points that I've talked about earlier. Um, let me know if you can hear the audio. I know it's risky playing video. <laughs> in a call. So Amelia, thank you very much for being Just here like for this. Up in the comments if you can hear the video. We're planning a brand new website for kids and we'd like your help. For your help today, I've got a special present for you after we finish. You see that? Uh, uh, you'll get it when we're done. Good. <laughs> and this shouldn't take more than about 30 minutes. If you need to take a break, at any time, just let me know and we can take a break, okay? Okay. Before we begin, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Um, first, how often do you go online? Every day. Every day, okay. What, what websites do you go to? Junior. And what's your favorite website? PBS Kids. Oh, so you have, so there's more than one website you like? Yeah. Do your, do your mom and daddy let you go online anytime you want? Not anytime. Oh, okay. So when do you get to go online? If mommy says yes, I can. If she says no, I can't. Oh, okay. This pen will be your mouse. Why don't you take it? Great. Uh, if you want to click on something, just tap on it with your pen. Whoops. Sorry about that. You can make it full screen and get to where you need to. Oh, okay. So Amelia, thank you very much for being here for this usability test today. All right, start from there. This pen, will be your mouse. Why don't you take it? Great. Uh, if you want to click on something, just tap on it with your pen. So what, what do you think about this website? It is great. <laughs> it's great. What, what's great about it? I like the word. What do you think you can do from here? I can do games, coloring pages, and Videos. Great. Okay. Thank you. I want you to remember that you came here to find pages to color in. Okay. Right? So that's what I'd like you to do is find some pages to color in. What would you do? I could click on here. Great. Okay. Well, when you click on there, it takes you to a page like this. Is 
this what you expected? Yes. What do you think you can do from here? I can click on the buttons. And what would that do? Click it to color it. Okay, what would you want to click on? Triceratops? Mm -hmm. Oh, and <laughs> you like all of them? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so I'm going to pause there. Um, so there are a few things that you see in this video that I'm going to touch on really quickly. So you see that the dad kind of introduces what he's, you know, going to talk about with his daughter. He asks her a few questions to, to get to know who she is as a, as a user and also kind of break the ice. Um, he talks about compensation. So I know a lot of you may not have compensation, um, be able to compensate your users with your project jams, but you can also just talk about like the value that your products could provide for the user. Um, you know, we're interested in X, Y, Z. And so that might, in itself might be, you know, compensation. Um, and then he goes into, you know, prototyping and you see like, he doesn't have a high fidelity prototype. It's literally paper that he's drawn with like, you know, a marker, but he's still able to get a lot of insights into what his daughter is able to see on the page and how she in interacts with it. Um, and um, so those are just some very key things um, that he's able to notice just with this very quick, I would say maybe medium fil fidelity paper prototype. So after the test, you always want to debrief, right? So you've kind of spent 30 minutes or an hour with a participant, you've asked them a bunch of questions, you've noticed some things. It's highly important while it's still fresh in your mind to just debrief with your participants really quickly. Um, or sorry, debrief with your team really quickly. So talk about things you notice, things that you think you wanna fix in your prototype, really small things, not changing your prototype entirely, but if you miss something, that you didn't catch in the pilot. And they're just high level findings. So what I'd like to do is just practice with y'all just coming up with questions just for this page that we saw in the, um, in the um, video earlier. So there are different kinds of questions you can ask. So first of all, what would we ask if we wanted to get the users like initial impressions or feelings about um, the, this page, like what kind of question would we ask them? Let's feel free to type or just, so, okay, I see, what do you think about it? That's a very good one. Anyone else? Okay, what came to your mind when you saw this? What stands out to you on this page? So those are all great questions. There's a question about, do you find it emotionally connecting? So one thing I would say about that is that that can potentially like be a leading question where they think, um, you know, they, feel, they think they need to find something emotionally connecting about the page. So you just wanna keep it open-ended, but make sure you're not leading them. All right, so what about discoverability? What if we wanted to find out if the user can, is able to see that play with Joe now button? How do we ask them to see if they, if they can discover that? One? What kind of questions would we ask? What do you think is the purpose of this page? That's a good one. That kind of gets them to talk about the different things they can do on the page. Anything else? Okay, are you, able, are you able to interact with the page? Yes. Okay, someone mentioned, how would you play with Joe if you wanted to? That could be potentially good um, if it was only Joe on the page, but it might also just direct the user exactly to the button. So you wanna be kind of wary of something like that because how you, know, you wanna trust the data that you're getting from the question. What's the first thing you saw on the page? That's also a good question to kind of see what jumps at, out at the user immediately. Yeah, so these are all really good examples. All right, so lastly, what if we wanted to test the copy? So this is something that you also wanna test. You're not just looking about, thinking about interactions or what's intuitive. Sometimes you wanna test copy, like do users understand what this means? So if we wanted to find out if users understood what play with Joe now meant, how would we, what kind of questions would we ask? 
what did this page do? So I think that's a little bit broad for um, this specific question about play with Joe now. Um, but it would be good for, if you clicked on this button, what would you expect to happen? Exactly. Did you try to play with Joe? What would you happen if you click on the button? Yeah, so this, uh, for the folks uh, talking about what would you expect to happen if you clicked on this button? Those are the exact kind of questions you'd want to ask. So when you're user testing, if you're trying to test copy, a good, a good way is kind of asking what they expect to happen, and then they say it, and then that way you have an idea before they actually go and click on the button. Um, and if in the earlier question about discoverability, they don't notice the button, then you can say, okay, did you notice the play with Joe button? Or even, even better than that, because you already know they didn't notice it, you can say, all right, look at that button that says play with Joe now. What do you think it does? So really awesome question ideas from everyone in the chat. All right, so just to kind of round up, um, there are a lot of resources for user testing. Um, you can check out usertesting.com or userzoom. Even better, if you, you can sign up to be a tester, and you get paid $10 per test. So, and it's a good way for you to kind of get perspective on what it is to be on the other side. Um, then uh, there's the master rainbow sheet, which I'm gonna, spreadsheet, which I'm gonna touch on in like a minute. But then there are also these two articles that I think are really good about talking about how to user test and just running usability tests. So the, mass, the rainbow spreadsheet, so especially with remote testing that you're doing now, sometimes when you're user testing, you have all these users, how do you keep all your data together? Um, the rainbow spreadsheet is just a really easy way of doing that. So on the, in column A here, you have like the insights. And so sometimes you can even write down what your insights are at the beginning, say, okay, did they notice the, Joe, the play with Joe button or did they notice the login button? But then as you go, you can add in new ob observations in the sheet. And then as you go through your different participants, you can note, you know, who, who saw what or who, um, you know, recognized these things. And so it's a very easy way for you to see in one easy sheet, you know, your results. So check that out, um, the rainbow spreadsheet. And that's all I got. If you have any additional questions, you can send them on the Slido. And if you want to reach out to me, you can message me on LinkedIn or just DM me on the product at Slack. Thank you. Thank you so much, Timmy. That was quite interesting. Uh, fun fact, me and Timmy were master's project partners, so I've worked with her. She's amazing to work with. And moving on, uh, we'll now move to Slido for any further questions. Uh, if you take back anything from this workshop or call, feel free to contact the speakers on LinkedIn uh, or post on about this on LinkedIn, tag us, tag the speakers, and uh, hope you all had a good time in this. And now, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be sharing the Slido screen. So feel free to go to Slido and we'll be taking further questions there for the panelists. So um, our first popular question is, what is the difference between a prototype and an MVP? And I think this question might be for Tushar since uh, he mentioned that in his slide. Yeah, sure. So I would say that the MVP is something that you build on all levels just to get the idea across and make sure that all you have all the buy-ins, all the necessary buy-ins, but a prototype could literally be at any stage. So you could have a MVP prototype. And then once the MVP prototype is like, oh, uh, you know, everyone approves it, your engineers build it, it's amazing. And then you have the version two prototype. So, you know, prototypes are just like a, a, a term that could go on, but the MVP is what, you know, how you sell that idea to your customers, your stakeholders, and get that buy-in. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Uh, next question uh, we have is from Soumya Tanwar. Any hacks on how we can do the crazy eight as a team in this virtual setting? And this question is for Abid. For sure, uh, that's a great question. Um, there's a couple of things you can do. Um, the way I've done it before is um, using two tools really. One, have some sort of video tool like Zoom or Google Hangouts and get everybody on there. And then secondly, find a tool like Figma or Envision Freehand that allows, um, I guess, mass collaboration. Uh, and this way you can view each other's mockups in one go without having to switch screens for people to present. So I really like Envision Freehand, it works really well. If you wanna try Figma, I think as a student, you can get it for free for two years if you sign up. Um, so that's a great option as well. Uh, as you saw from Tushar's uh, link, uh, you can see different people operate on a Figma screen all at once. It's a great way to uh, collaborate uh, digitally. That makes sense. 
And uh, based on that, we also have a next question from Anonymous. Could you recommend some prototyping software for beginners to share? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think I mentioned using design tools like Figma, Sketch, and Adobe XD. But if, if you feel like that's too much of a learning curve, I'm putting a link in the chat, which is literally a sketch prototype tool. So you literally make your sketches by hand and then it transforms it into like uh, an interface that, you know, works on iOS and Android and you can literally make your prototypes through that. So that should be like a great starting point for people. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing I'd love to add on there, if you don't mind, is yeah, sure. um, also don't be afraid to just use pen and paper and take a yep. picture of that and share it. If yep. you're having trouble maybe getting started or you're a little bit afraid to kind of, you know, uh, learn these tools, grab a pen and paper, take a snapshot, upload that through, sl through Slack, and that's a great way to have a discussion point as well. Yep. And most of these tools are very similar when you start with the PowerPoint. So as you start with PowerPoint and you learn different animations, you can similarly do so in this. Next question we have is again for Tushar. What is the difference between UX design versus UXE? And are UX designer the same as UI designers? Sure, so I think the UXE role only exists at a few places and it's like synonymous to front-end developers and UI developers and everything. But I would say the difference between the UXE and the UXE role is that the UXTs are both focused on the interaction and the, and the design part of things, whereas the UXE can be a part, uh, depending on the company and the role, they could be a part of the design process, but their main job is to make sure that they're that uh, common connection between the designers and the developers, as I mentioned. So how do we make, are these designs feasible? And how do we make sure that, you know, we go from static design mockups to a fully functioning prototype that developers understand how to build and test? Definitely makes sense. Uh, next question is about ta for Tami, but it's regarding a slide deck. Uh, can I ask what you used to design this and where you found such inclusive illustrations? Yeah, so the deck is actually a Google slide template that I found online. I'll share it in the link. But for illustrations, there are two other sites that I go to on Draw. They have a lot of um, good um, diverse illustrations. And then there's all this other website called Black Illustrations. I'll share all three. On the, on the chat. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, next question we have is for Adil. How can we prototype wireframes digitally for LoFi? Yeah, great question. Um, again, I guess in this case, I'd refer to using um, apps for this. I mean, a, a really free and simple one is draw.io by Google. Um, it's a super easy tool to use that you can use to create simple wireframes that don't quite look like they're drawn by pen and pencil. So it's a little bit more professional. Uh, but that's a great tool you can use um, or lose a charge or something similar is a great start. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So I think we have time for one last question and we might do it related to product management. So uh, let's take this last two. So for Adil, uh, working as an agile product owner, planning to move to product manager, should a UX, should I be a UX designer or also should I be technically strong? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, this is like, I guess the age old question, right? Do product managers need to have a technical background? Um, I think the way I look at it is that over time, you want to build your skill set in each of the three sections, business, uh, tech, and design, but you don't necessarily need that right away out of the gate, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're maybe leaning more towards, hey, I really like UI and UX, then that's fine if that's your skill set for being combined with product management to start with. Later on, you can build those technical skills. So I don't necessarily think you need to um, focus in one or the other. It's great if you have a broader skill set. Product managers are usually generalists. So you're not going to be the one uh, sitting on a laptop beside an engineer and pulling out a PR request or sitting beside a designer and uh, pushing through a design on Figma. You're there as a consultant for the most part and you're a generalist. So it's great if you know a little bit about everything, but you don't necessarily need to go in depth about being the best coder or being you know as good as Tushar or good as Temi on, on design and UI. That's my mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah, I mean, sorry, so. just to quickly, you know, add on to what it was, was just said. A lot of times you probably heard of like the T-shaped mm. PM, where you have depth in one thing, but breadth in other yes, things, yes. right? So just kind of think of yourself in that way. Um, and that's why you have, a, you know, a team of other experts to work with and to lean on. Mm -hmm. Definitely okay. makes sense. So uh, we'll have this as the last question uh, in the interest of time. 
what's an optimal amount of people for user testing, Tami? Yeah, so there are different heuristics for different research methods. Um, for user testing, generally, I think the recommendations around six is where you get, where at that point you have enough insight. Um, I wouldn't do more than eight. So maybe if you're doing maybe some sort of like A-B comparison, maybe you would do eight, um, four for one, four for the other, but I wouldn't do more than that. Okay. So for any questions that haven't uh, been answered yet, you can feel free to contact Adil, Tami, or Tushar on the product but Slack. Uh, all three of them are there to provide uh, guidance. And Tami is also one of the project mentors. So feel free to contact them and I'll hand it over to Grace for our final announcements. Fantastic. Thank you, Darsh. Thank you to um, our amazing speakers today. Uh, once again, connect with all of them on LinkedIn. Send them your messages of appreciation on Slack as well, uh, because I even learned so, so much from these presentations and I hope you all did as well. Uh, be sure to post on LinkedIn with what you learned and subscribe to the Product Buds YouTube channel to watch a recording of this event so that you can go back and reabsorb all the amazing insights from this presentation. Uh, just last minute uh, note from my end is that myself and some members of the Product Buds team are going to be on a LinkedIn Live this upcoming Wednesday uh, from 5 to 6 p.m. PST on the Juan Salting LinkedIn page. So for anyone who doesn't know, Juan Salting is uh, an amazing, amazing uh, company that is focused on turning underdogs to winners. And if you want to know what that means, uh, he, I just dropped a link in the chat, uh, check out Juan Salting. Myself and the Product Buds team will be speaking on there about Product Buds, about how we got started, our journey, our story. So uh, definitely tune in to that this Wednesday. Um, and yeah, stay active on the, the Product Buds Slack channel. Uh, we love and appreciate every single one of you and thank you all so much for your support. Uh, that's it on my end. Does anybody else on my team have any updates? Thank you all for coming and thank you for the wonderful speakers that we had. Um, it, it, like, it was such an engaging presentation and despite having, I think at one point we had like 80, 82 people in the room, um, you've definitely engaged everyone. So thank you for share, uh, spending your Sunday and your father day, father day with us today. We appreciate you. Thanks for having us. Bye everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye.